no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and thanks for listening. When I first started studying space science, I was very excited about ion engines. I did not think it was reasonable to take eight to nine months to get to Mars. I wanted to get there faster. I started designing an ion drive based rapid transit vehicle. I felt that equipment and supplies could be landed on Mars with uncrewed landers, and these could be followed by my rapid transit ion ship. This ship would use solar panels and hydrogen oxygen fuel cells. The energy from these sources would power the ship and the ion engine. The water produced by the fuel cells would be pumped into inflatable shells around the ship to shield the crew from radiation. Argon or xenon would be the propellant for the ion drive. Argon would be better as it is easily available on both the Earth and Mars. I had studied ion drives and understood that the efficiency of these engines was up to 10 times better than the best chemical engines. Why would anyone want to use chemical rockets when these beautiful advanced systems were available? Then I started doing the math. Things always look simple until you get into the details. But being able to understand the details is how you find what really works. Let's do an analysis of this together and see what we find. Let's start with a really big ship. We'll need help from our friends at SpaceX Vision. They have designed this 250-ton ion-propelled single-launch space station. It looks much better than my little design. These people are much better with graphics than I am, and a picture is worth a thousand words. We see the station and second stage in orbit prior to separation. The second stage is a modified starship, not meant for re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. After separation, the second stage is used as a fuel depot in orbit, while the station deploys its solar arrays. These arrays would provide power to the station. Remember, things like life support take a lot of power and must run continually. The front of the ship has foldable protection panels for the observation deck. On the back of the ship, we see a large ion engine. Ion engines are very interesting. Let's evaluate this advanced propulsion method using something as big as a starship. But while a starship is designed to come back into the atmosphere and land, this ship is designed to spend the rest of its life in space. As a station around Earth or the moon, as a transorbital shuttle, or as a deep space research vessel. Let's evaluate this advanced spaceship to see how it would work. This is a 250-ton single-launch space station with an ion engine. SpaceX Vision has designed this ship to be launched on a modified Starship second stage with one booster. It has a familiar overall design, ending up like an enlarged SpaceX Falcon 9, which has a larger diameter fairing than the rocket. They would be aerodynamically similar. It is 31 meters long and 13 meters in diameter with a mass of 250 tons. It has a pressurized volume of 2,200 cubic meters, more than double that of the ISS. It has enough space for personal sleeping cabins, exercise areas, and a large observation deck. Here they show disposable window coverings. Sports could be played in here, but don't make Elon look bad. The internal volume can be modified for different missions, and a centrifuge could be included for low-gravity research or to keep the crew healthy. With a radius of 6.5 meters, it would have to spin at almost 12 RPM to produce Earth gravity, which would only be tolerable if you were lying down and did not move. But an inner centrifuge could have a spin of 4.75 RPMs, which would be close to lunar gravity. And that would be important for animal research with mice, to study the changes associated with the effects of lunar gravity on the body. A spin of 6.6 .6 RPM would reproduce Mars gravity for the same purpose. This type of research has never been properly done on the International Space Station, and is an extreme failure of bureaucracy. The Bigelow Aerospace Company spent its own money developing a gravity wheel for the ISS. I don't know what NASA or politicians have against Bigelow, but the device was never deployed. Now we see a large deployable solar array unfolding. There are four foldable arrays measuring 420 square meters each, for a total of 1,680 square meters. If these were made out of the most efficient solar panel technology existing today, it would produce 300 kilowatts per hour per panel. These would be very advanced solar panels. With an efficiency of 52.5% in Earth orbit, where the sun's flux is about 1,360 watts per square meter on average. At the orbit of Mars, that would drop to about 604 watts per square meter. That would give a total power available of 1.2 megawatts at Earth, and a little more than half a megawatt at Mars orbit. 
and it can maintain a permanent crew of 20. Now their design seems to show their engine using a xenon propellant. You can tell the type of ion propellant by the glow it gives off. This is fine for Earth orbit, where you can resupply, but on Mars, xenon would be hard to get. I want to launch this into orbit. In their design, they show their 250-ton ship making it to orbit with one booster. Let's do some math and see if this is possible. The full mass of a booster with propellant is 3,580 tons. That's 180 tons of dry mass, 3,400 tons of propellant. The Starship second stage usually has a total mass of 1,320 tons, with 1,200 tons of propellant and 120 tons of dry mass. Let's take off 20 tons for the wings, nose, and walls from the tanks up. The full mass of the second stage will be estimated as 1,300 tons. The mass of the third stage ion ship is given as 250 tons. But we will need some propellant. Let's assume 5 tons of argon propellant, giving a final mass of 245 tons for the third stage if it burns all its propellant. Our advanced starship will launch with a total mass of 5,130 tons. The first stage will burn all of its 3,400 tons of propellant, giving the ship a delta V of 3.52 kilometers per second. The 180 ton empty booster will drop away, and the rest of the ship, with an initial mass of 1,550 tons, will fire the second stage engines and keep going. We will burn through the 1,200 tons of propellant in the second stage, adding another 5.55 kilometers per second as it burns out. The final mass will be 350 tons, if they don't detach the second stage. We have a total delta V at this point of 9.07 kilometers per second. The empty second stage is supposed to stay in orbit, but if we check our delta V total against the minimum low Earth orbit requirement, which is 9.7 kilometers per second, we see that we haven't made it. If we were to detach the second stage and fire our ion drive, we could produce another 0.30 kilometers per second. Not enough, and we fall back out of orbit. We would need to have at least 11 tons of ion propellant to get our ship into orbit with a delta V of 9.73 kilometers per second. And the thrust would probably be too weak. The ion engine would probably not produce this delta V fast enough. What could we do to help our friends out and get the entire second stage and our space station into orbit? Behold, the SpaceX Super Duper Heavy. Triple Super Heavy? Ultra Super Heavy. Yes. Behold the ultra super heavy booster system. Let's do the math. We would have an initial mass of 12,290 tons. We would burn all the fuel in the three boosters, giving us a delta V of 5.74 kilometers per second. I can't find any graphics of this, so we'll just watch the Falcon Heavy. The empty boosters would drop away, and the second stage would burn, adding its 5.55 kilometers per second. And there we are. 11.28 kilometers per second of delta V. That's just about enough, in fact, to get this thing all the way to Mars or Venus. Now we are talking. I want to take a run past Venus on our way to Mars, deploying balloon probes into the atmosphere as we go by. This would be a beautiful exploration ship. It could even carry two small landers for Deimos and Phobos. If we can just talk Elon into modifying a starship into an extended second stage. But first, let's consider putting this in low Earth orbit and keeping the second stage as a fuel depot. If we use it as a space station, would the ion engine work to keep it in its proper orbit? Low Earth orbits are affected by atmospheric drag and the gravitational pull of other bodies like the sun and moon. These are called orbital perturbations and must be corrected. The current International Space Station orbits at an altitude of about 400 kilometers. This keeps it above most of the atmosphere, but below the Van Allen radiation belts, which would be dangerous to the crew. There is still some drag at this altitude, however. Several times a year, the International Space Station has to be boosted to a higher speed to compensate for speed lost to atmospheric drag. When this is needed, the station uses a Soyuz spacecraft to provide this thrust. The Soyuz uses chemical engines to accomplish this. A space station does not need much delta V. The ISS ends up needing between 5 and 12 tons of propellant per year to counteract orbital perturbations and atmospheric drag. This is using the hypergolic engines on a Soyuz capsule. These engines have a specific impulse of around 330 seconds. This means the ejection velocity is 330 seconds times 9.81 meters per second squared, giving 3,237 meters per second. The ISS has a mass of 419,700 kilograms. If we use that as the final mass and add in our propellant to make an initial mass, 
we get 424,700 kilograms to 431,700 kilograms respectively. If we take the ratio of initial mass over final mass, then take the natural log and multiply that by our ejection velocity, this means a delta V of 38 meters per second to 91 meters per second is needed per year to boost the ISS back up to speed to counteract atmospheric friction. If we assume the same delta V budget for our ion-powered advanced spaceship, we can calculate the propellant mass needed. We see that they are using a Hall Effect ion engine like the NASA X3. If you are rusty on ion propulsion, please review this lesson. If the ISS used a similar engine for station keeping, how much propellant would it need to use? Chemical engines have an efficiency of at best 450 seconds specific impulse. This is for Hydrolox engines in vacuum. The SpaceX Starship will be using liquid methane and have a specific impulse at sea level around 330 seconds for the booster, while Starship itself will fire at a much higher altitude and will have a specific impulse of around 380 seconds. A Hall Effect ion thruster can have a specific impulse of around 1,500 seconds. And let's round up to an even 100 meters per second of delta V for station keeping for the ISS and we can work backwards to find our propellant need. We have to do some algebra with the rocket equation. Delta V equals ejection velocity times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass. We know the final mass of the ISS is 419,700 kilograms. We know the delta V needed for station keeping is no more than 100 meters per second. If we multiply the specific impulse by 9.81 meters per second squared, we have the ejection velocity, 14,715 meters per second. Let's solve for the initial mass. Delta V divided by VE equals the natural log of initial mass over final mass. The inverse of the natural log is E to the X. So E to the power of delta V over VE equals MI over MF. MI equals the final mass times E, which has a value of 2.71828 to the power of delta V over VE. And see that we would still need 2,862 propellant for our ion engine to produce enough thrust for station keeping for the ISS. But the ISS has a mass of over 400,000 kilograms, and our advanced starship only has a mass of 250 tons. So putting that into our equation instead gives us 1,705 kilograms of propellant for the ion engine on our single launch space station to keep it in low Earth orbit for one year, instead of the 12 tons needed by the ISS. At 16 newtons of force producing 100 meters per second of delta V would require the engine to fire for the mass is 250 tons or 250,000 kilograms. The force applied is 16 newtons. Force equals mass times acceleration, so acceleration would equal force divided by mass, giving us 0 0.000064 meters per second squared acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity over time. So time is the change in velocity over acceleration. We need a change in velocity of 100 meters per second. Divide that by our acceleration and we get 1,562,500 seconds, which comes out to 18 days. No problem. They were considering using Vassimer engines to boost the ISS. This would save propellant mass that has to be sent up to the station every year. But it looks like NASA has dropped this plan. Perhaps because it is simpler and cheaper to keep doing it the way they have been. Or because Vassimer and ion engines need a lot of power. 200 kilowatts, in fact to produce just 5.4 newtons. Let's look at using the ion engine to get us from low Earth orbit to the moon. The delta V needed to get from low Earth orbit to a translunar injection orbit is 3.2 kilometers per second. To get from the translunar injection orbit to a low polar lunar orbit is another 0 0.9 kilometers per second. That gives us a total of 4.10 kilometers per second needed. SpaceX Vision has estimated the power of their ion engine at 16 newtons. The NASA X3 is one meter in diameter and the largest Hull Effect ion engine tested so far. It puts out 5.4 newtons using 200 kilowatts of electrical power. We would have to assume that a larger engine putting out 16 newtons of thrust would need at least 600 kilowatts of power. We can definitely spare that in orbit around the Earth, where our solar panels can produce 1,200 kilowatts of power. We said we want to move our spaceship out of low Earth orbit to a low lunar orbit. We said we need a delta V of 4.10 kilometers per second. We know the mass of our ship is 250 tons. How much of our mass will need to be propellant to get the job done? We can work the problem just like before. Delta V equals ejection velocity times the natural log of the initial mass over the final mass. We know the delta V, initial mass, and ejection velocity. Solving for the final mass gives us a value of 66,696. We would need 183,304 kilograms of propellant. That doesn't leave much mass left over for everything else. And how long would it take us with a thrust of 16 newtons to get our space station to the moon? 
If we apply a force of 16 newtons to an initial mass of 250 tons, we get an acceleration again of 0.000064 meters per second squared. That seems a little slow. If we keep the force going so as to affect a change in velocity of 4.10 kilometers per second, much more than the 100 meters per second we needed for station keeping, and knowing that acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time, we find that it would take 4,100 meters per second divided by 0.000064 meters per second squared equals 64,062,500 seconds, or a little more than two years. That won't work. The main problem with ion engines is not that they aren't extremely efficient, but that they are so weak. While they might be okay for station keeping, they do not make good engines for ship propulsion. They cannot process propellant mass fast enough to have much thrust. By the way, taking several months to climb through the Van Allen radiation belts would kill everyone on board. We had better plan to use vacuum raptor engines and refuel this thing in orbit, sending up tankers to refuel the still attached second stage, then head out to the moon, Mars, or Venus. Go into orbit around these and send down smaller reusable landing craft and probes. Or bring it down onto Deimos or Phobos. The main advantage to this over a regular starship is that you are not carrying all that landing mass. Those wings or flaps or flings as I've heard them called. And it is optimized for deep space operations. The SpaceX Vision single launch space station would give you a lunar gateway in one launch. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us on Patreon if you can. There's a link in the description, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.